Um, okay, so I just want to give you a little history about the Blue Gene Project, because it's not really a recent phenomenon, the Blue Gene, even though the Blue Gene Q is a, a very high performance architecture right now, and like I said, Argon uh, has a large machine. It actually started back in about 1999 as a research project at IBM. Um, and the initial target actually wasn't generalized computing, it was specifically oriented towards protein folding, but as they did the design of it, it, it morphed into this more general purpose machine. And what you'll see today is the blue genes are general purpose machines. You can compute anything from you know, the protein folding that they initially looked at to fluid mechanics to plasma physics to astrophysics. So it's used pretty much any, you know, for any kind of simulation uh, that you can think of. Um, it, it didn't come out of nowhere, it started from a, some, you know, uh, Earlier projects, uh, one was called Cyclops 64, and the other one uh, was the QCD uh, OC architecture. Um, in 2004, the first BlueGene hardware appeared. So this has been around for almost over a decade now. Uh, it was the BlueGene L. Uh, the big, first big BlueGene machine was at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. It was uh, 90 teraflops, which doesn't seem that big to us today. But at the time, it was big enough to get it on the top number one spot on the top 500 list, uh, knocking off the Japanese uh, Earth simulator. And that machine grew over the years, and eventually, once it was retired, it had reached uh, 600 teraflops, so they kept adding to it. Uh, and this kept the machine on the top 500 for three and a half, number one on the top 500 for three and a half years, which is, you know, almost unheard of. Uh, and you can see that this has been a profoundly important architecture in, you know, high-end HPC systems. So this, uh, the fir first machine, like I said, came up at the end of 2004, actually, and shortly after that, in 2005, Argon got its first uh, rack of Blue Gene L. So just a relatively small system, 5.6 teraflops. Um, but we immediately started planning to get a bigger one. So in 2006, the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, uh, where I work, was created. And we started working with IBM on the design of the Blue Gene Q, uh, the follow-on to the Blue Gene L, the Blue Gene P. So IBM you know, did a good job of working with their customers and the scientific community in designing these machines. And I think that's a big reason why it was so successful. Is these were custom design machines for high performance computing. And so, as part of that, IBM spent a lot of time trying to understand what people use these machines for. Um, so we spent a number of years talking to them, and that successfully produced the BlueGene P machine, of which we had a 40-rack uh, system called Intrepid. Uh, some of you here might have used it back in the day. Uh, it was 557 teraflops. And pretty much in this business, as soon as you roll out one machine, you've got to start thinking of the next one. So immediately following that, IBM and us started thinking, well, what do we do next? And then that was the BlueGene Q. Uh, so again, we started working with IBM, this time in a lot more detail. We had numerous meetings, calls, you know, uh, design documents passed back and forth between us um, over the next three years. And that resulted in the Blue Gene Q system, um, the one at Ar Argonne that we have is 48 rack, 10 pedal flop system called Mira. Um, it, we got it in 2012 and it went into production shortly after we received it. Um, so I want to take a moment, you know, for better or for worse, top 500 is often how we look at and rate, um, you know, HPC systems. And if you look at top 500 and see what the, you know, the Blue Gene architecture achieved over the last 10 years, it's pretty impressive. I, I think you can argue that it's basically been the dominant architecture in the large-scale HPC um, systems. So since uh, over the last 10 years, it's been number one on about half the lists. And on most lists, you know, any given list you look at, you usually see, you know, two, three, maybe four. Um, blue gene systems listed in the top 10. And currently, if you look at the list, you'll see that uh, we, in fact, have four blue gene Q systems listed there. Uh, the number three, number five, number eight, and number nine. Uh, the largest is at Livermore, and uh, the Argonne system is number five on the list. And it's also been an exceptionally power uh, efficient system. Then uh, this was based on, you know, baked into the design from the, uh, the origin, and it's getting uh, 2.3 gigaflops per watt currently. Uh, so what is it that makes a blue gene a blue gene? Well, you can look at it, and as I mentioned, all right, obviously it's, it's been oriented since the outset on high performance computing. So the whole package, top to bottom, not just the processor, but the network, memory, and everything that goes into it was oriented towards making this a productive system for scientific computing. And I think it's been very successful in that regard, not just in terms of being on the top 500 list, but in terms of being productive for science. Um, now, the interesting thing is, even though it's been basically one of the dominant architectures in um, you know, large-scale HPC, if you look at the individual components, they're not very powerful. All right? And this has sort of become a more prevalent um, design philosophy. You know, certainly, Intel sort of adopted it with the Xeon uh, Phi. But at the time, this was, it was fairly novel. 
And the idea was, well, we'll take a lot of lightweight processors. Um, so in this case, the, the, the processor that the BlueGene uses is PowerPC core. And they're mostly, the types of cores that the BlueGene is using is found in relatively low power, low in, you know, compute intensity applications like embedded systems. Um, and they run at low frequency. So if you look at the original L, it was only running at 700, 700 megahertz. And this was back, you know, even back in 2004, uh, that time frame, 700 megahertz was pretty slow. I mean, it was several, you know, a factor of two or three less than what your laptop computer would offer. Have. And even now, the BlueGene Q is not that fast. It's 1.6 gigahertz, which isn't terrible, but it's still generally slower than you're going to find on even cheap machines, uh, personal machines these days. Now, the way it achieves its power, you know, is obviously then through having a lot of these, right? So that's been a big part of the BlueGene all along. It's been having massive parallelism, you know, basically unprecedented, unprecedented levels of parallelism uh, in an architecture. Um, so the original BlueGene L was uh, two cores. Uh, P was 4, and the Blue Gene Q is 16. And what we end up with on these systems, if you look at the largest L, P, and Q systems, was that you end up with many aggregate cores. So the L had 200,000 cores on it, and this was back in 2004. So this was an amazing number of cores. Um, the largest uh, Q system at Livermore has 1.5 million uh, processor cores. So that means if you want to run on the whole system, you have to find a way of expressing parallelism you know, at over a million MPI ranks or a million tasks, I should say. They don't have to be ranks. Um, now, a key to making that work is having a fast communication network. So the, the BlueGene architecture was designed and developed specifically with a high performance network that was low latency, high bandwidth. And it's a Taurus network, which is a pretty um, common or you know, widely used architecture for networks in HPC systems over the last few years. Uh, the L and the P had a 3D Taurus. Um, the Q has a 5D Taurus, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. And what this results in is, is a very nicely balanced system where you have a relatively lightweight processor. The memory is standard DDR um, uh, memory that you find in a, you know, most machines, and desktop machines, laptop machines. Um, and then the network is very fast. So what you find is that you, you know, you're not bottlenecking on the processor or the memory, sorry, not bottlenecking on the memory or the network nearly as much as you are on some other architectures. Um, and uh, you know, it, the design of BlueGene goes beyond just the, the hardware. So this system was designed holistically. So it's not just the hardware. IBM built both the hardware and the software. So a big part of the software, getting performance out of this, is design, uh, designing the software um, in a way that lets you utilize the hardware efficiently. And in this case, they, you know, one instance of that was the operating system. So it's Linux-like, but it's not Linux. It's actually called CNK. And it's designed specifically to be low overhead so that it didn't add any noise and you know, create any uh, slowdowns in, in your MPI operations, especially when you're doing collectives or barriers. Uh, but the nice thing is, when you program it, from a programmer's perspective, this machine, even though there's a lot of things that are different than your typical cluster or laptop, desktop computer, from a programming perspective, it looks very similar. All right? You look looks like you're running on a Linux system. All the standard Linux APIs are there. Um, you program it in Fortran. You program it in C, C++. You use MPI. You use OpenMP. So a code that you wrote somewhere else that has never been run on BlueGene often has no issues. You need to just bring it over, compile it, and run it. Now, you may have to address some issues later on about scaling, because we have a lot more processors than you typically most codes have seen before they get onto a BlueGene. But as far as compiling and running the code, often it will run right out of the box with no problems. Um, and there's a lot of other unique features to the BlueGene system that uh, I'll mention briefly. So you know, the, the hardware is all custom designed. So it's a custom designed system on a chip. The idea here is that um, you know, they wanted to reduce both the footprint, um, uh, the, the, the power consumption, and increase the reliability. And I think they've done that very successfully. Uh, so this slide is really just a quick, uh, I just want to throw this up real quick. It's kind of a block diagram or a schematic of what really constitutes the full Blue Gene Q system. And in this talk, I'm only going to talk about the things on the right, which are the blue boxes, which are the compute nodes, and the torus that connects them. Um, and I'll mention them briefly, the red boxes, which are the I.O. nodes. But I just wanted to kind of let you know that there's a lot of other pieces to this puzzle that makes up the whole Blue Gene system. And people like Pete, who think about you know, software and overall system architectures, you know, also have to focus on the other side of this diagram, which is how does everything talk to everything, you know, the fr file service, the front end nodes, what network do they go across, and how do you control and coordinate you know, 1.5 million cores? How do you get them to all boot up and run, you know, uh, get, run the same executable. And so there's a whole s control system that IBM developed. And some of the people here at Argonne also worked with them uh, to do that. And a lot of software layers like MPI and things like that that are involved in it. So um, 
like I said, I just kind of wanted to mention that, that a lot of that stuff is there, but what we're going to look at is all the items on the right. Um, so so if, you, if you walked into our machine room and opened one of the cabinets and started pulling out pieces, um, this is what you would see. So the smallest piece you can pretty much pull out of the machine is the node. And so that diagram on the upper part there is what a node card looks like. So the, the big rectangle in the middle, the silver one, is the processor. Um, and it's got 18 cores in it, so it's two point, uh, 205 gigaflops total for each process, uh, compute node. Um, in, in addition to the cores, inside that, that processor, you also have the memory controller and the network interface. There's a lot of things baked into that one little piece. And the only other major part that's on the node, or parts that are on the node, are the memory. So that's all the little black squares. That's memory that's been soldered onto the printed circuit board. Uh, for reliability purposes. So that means if the memory goes bad, you can't just replace it. You have to throw the whole node card away. And you can't add memory to it either. It's pretty much designed as 16 gigabytes per node, and that's all it's ever going to be. Um, and the other piece that's on there, and it's on the very bottom, you can see a little part that juts out below the printed circuit board is the network connectors. So it's fairly compact, and this is about the size of your cell phone, maybe a little bit larger, but that's all it is for a node. And 32 of, the, of those nodes are packed into a tray, so that's what you see in the next diagram down. It's a little hard to see, but they're vertically stuck into that tray. Um, and then there's 32 of them, it gives you 6.4 teraflops of compute performance. Um, and then each one of those plugs into a network. Now it's electrical within the tray, and then once you want to start talking to other nodes off the tray and off the rack, you have to go across a fiber optic network. And to a programmer, this looks transparent. You don't see this, but in practice, your, your data is running across a couple different network components. And this was done kind of to optimize the overall cost of the system. They used electrical connections where things were close and electrical connections are cheaper. They used fiber optics when things were far away and you needed to have the extra performance. Um, now, one of the things that's unique to the queue um, um, that we didn't have in the LRP is water cooling. So you can kind of see on the, the right here, there's a couple of black lines coming in. These are actually water lines. So we got Cold water coming in, it runs through these copper pipes and around, they're connected to all the node cards with a heat exchanger on each card, and then it runs back out. Um, and finally, you have other ancillary pieces like power supplies. Once you have your node card together, you take 32 of them, you stick them into a cabinet that's a rack, and you get uh, 205 teraflops of computing power. Um, and like I said, this, uh, the blue gene, the, this forms a full torus network within a rack, and the dimensions are four by four by four by eight by two, because it's a 5D torus. Um, there's also what we call I.O. nodes. So in addition to the compute nodes that do the computing, you also often have to talk to the outside world. So you know, if you want to read data off a disk or write data to a disk, um, you have to have a channel to that disk uh, subarray. That's actually a fairly complex piece of hardware that most of our, you know, so I'm a, I'm a, uh, you know, uh, a computational scientist. I do you know, run large scale simulations. I don't think about my I.O. a lot or how that has to happen. But, Turns out there's actually a lot of complexity in the I.O. subsystems, too. Um, and all your I.O. operations run across these I.O. nodes. Um, so these are the systems we have at Argon. So if, if you took one of those racks, um, you can see it right here, and you got 47 more of them, and you put them in three rows of 16, you'd have Mira. And Mira is, uh, so it's got 48,000 nodes overall, uh, 786,000 processor cores, um, and 768 terabytes of memory peak floating point uh, speed of 10 petaflops, and it's currently number five on the top 500. So like I said, you know, there's a lot of parallelism on these blue gene cube machines. Just to use every core, uh, put one rank or, or thread or process, you need to have you know, almost million way parallelism expressed in your code. So it's certainly a programming challenge, but it's something people have and do you know, succeed in um, you know, overcoming. People run across the whole system. It's not uncommon at all to see this system running with, you know, um, you know, jobs typically using a third to half the machine um, and periodically the whole machine. So, um, you know, while it's, while it's a unique environment, it's certainly something that people have been able to utilize and, you know, achieve uh, very, very large scale uh, simulations um, and, and really interesting science as a result. Um, if you're not quite ready for Mira, we have a few smaller systems. We have one called Cetus and Vesta. Um, they're basically just scaled down versions of, of Mira. So Cetus has four racks now, or 4,000 nodes, and Vesta has two. Um, and uh, all the numbers scale proportionately. Uh, you'll notice the, you know, that even our smaller system, uh, Cetus, is now almost a petaflop. It's 820 teraflops. So the, there's a lot of computing power in a small footprint in the blue gene. Um, just quickly mention, we also have x86 and NVIDIA systems. I didn't want to give you the impression that all we have is, is blue gene. Um, mostly these are used for dig, uh, data visualization at Argon. And we have uh, 30 petabytes of storage. 
All right, so if you take a look at the BlueGeneQ chip, what do you see? Well, it's built on 45 nanometer technology. It's got 1.5 billion transistors. And essentially, if you look at this, um, this is what happens if you strip away the package. All along the outside perimeter, along the top, along the bottom, you have the processor cores. And if you count them up, there's 18 of them. Um, in the middle, there's this blue thing, which is called a crossbar switch. And this connects everything to everything inside the chip. And what it's connecting is the processor cores to the L2 cache. So the L2 cache is all these little blocks that kind of live in the middle here. Um, and there's 16 of those too, and I'll talk about that a little more later. And like I said, the, the blue gene queue is it's not the processor core. Ha the processor has, you know, not just the the cores embedded on it, but also the memory controllers. Um, they're sitting along the left and right edge, um, and the uh, chip to chip networking. Now these days, it's not uncommon to see the memory controller baked into a chip, but the uh, the on having the networking on chip is fairly unique to the blue gene, and it's nice because it gives you basically low latency, high bandwidth. Um, access you know, on the network from the cores all the way out to the network. Um, this is basically just another schematic of the uh, sort of a different view of the, the arrangement of the uh, components of the BlueGeneQ processor. Um, so in this case, you have all the processor cores on the left. And you can see that they're all connected to the crossbar switch that runs down the middle. And on the right side is the L2 cache. And it's broken up into a bunch of different L2 slices that are also all connected to the crossbar switch. Eight of each of those slices is connected to a memory controller, which goes out to external memory. And down here, you have the network, which is sitting on the same crossbar switch as the, uh, the processor. So it has basically equally fast access to the memory as a, uh, a regular processor core. Um, now, there's a few unique spe uh, features that, are, um, that I'll mention a, couple, a little bit about uh, for the BlueGene uh, processor core. So one is a four-wide SIMD floating point uh, vector unit. So that's what really gives these kind of lightweight um, PowerPC cores, their floating point performance. Uh, and that's the thing that if you want to program well on the BlueGeneQ um, for floating point intensive codes, that's what you really have to take advantage of. If you don't utilize the, the vector unit, you're giving up a lot of the performance of the machine. And there's a few other useful features that I think in practice people don't um, utilize as much because they don't really benefit you quite as much you know, for most codes. One is transactional memory and speculative execution. That's a kind of unique feature to the BlueGeneQ. Um, and uh, fast memory-based atomics. Now, some of these are baked into some of the things like OpenMP or MPI. So you're using them even if you don't explicitly um, write, you know, write code in your you know, um, software to utilize them. Um, there's also things like stream-based and list-based prefetching, uh, wake-up unit, and uh, universal performance counters, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, so this is uh, kind of a further zoom in to the processor core. And um, it's, like I said before, it's a PowerPC core. And it implements basically a standard um, PowerPC uh, instruction set. It's based off the uh, Power ISA uh, version uh, 206, with one exception, which is the uh, instructions that you need to operate the vector unit. So these are unique to the blue gene. Uh, they're called QPX instructions. So um, all of them will start with Q. If you were programming an assembly, you'd see a lot of it. So if you look at your code and disassemble it, and it's done a good job of vectorizing, you see a lot of instructions in there that start with Q. Uh, those are the ones you want to see. Uh, as I mentioned before, the processor runs at 1.6 gigahertz. Uh, it's in order execution, which means you know, the processor is not going to reorder your instructions. If it hits a pipeline stall on one instruction, it's going to wait until um, you know, that instruction is completed before it issues another one, um, or if there's a dependency. Um, so you know, um, this is unlike the Intel chip. So this is a simpler chip architecture where it doesn't try to do a lot of fancy things to you know, make your single-threaded performance run fast. What it does do is it provides you with uh, four-way simultaneous multi-threading. So this is, if you're familiar with hyper-threads, this is the same idea. So there's four hardware threads that can run on a processor core. And it can essentially interleave the instructions between the four hardware threads. So if one thread stalls because it's waiting for data to come from memory, um, you know, instead of sitting there idle for a few hundred cycles, it'll just go on to the next hardware thread and immediately start issuing instructions from that thread. Um, so you can run up to four of them. And this is something you want to do if you're programming on the blue gene. You want to look at using more than one process or thread per core uh, for multiple reasons. One is to hide this stall latency uh, that you might have. And another reason I'll talk on in a second. Um, so this, the registers, it's got 32 64-bit integer and floating point registers. This is standard PowerPC architecture. It's got branch prediction units. Um, it's got four main functional units. Um, one is the instruction unit, so that's this orange box up here. And essentially, um, it you know, looks at your assembly instructions, decides which ones to issue and where. And where it's issuing, to, issuing them to are the execution units 
and the AXU, or the auxiliary execution unit. And the execution unit handles all the instructions that are your standard PowerPC instructions, so, you know, branch instructions, loads, loaded store instructions, all the non-floating point instructions. And the AXU handles all the floating point instructions. So you essentially have two pipelines on this architecture, an X XU pipeline and an AXU pipeline. So you can, in theory, issue two instructions per cycle, one to the AXU and one to the XU every um, uh, clock tape. The, there's one wrinkle to this, which is, um, if you look at this last bullet point down here, it says, yeah, you can issue two instructions per cycle, one to the XU and one to the AXU, the instructions have to be from different hardware threads. So if you only have one hardware thread, it can only issue at most one instruction per cycle. If you have two hardware threads, you have the possibility of issuing two instructions per cycle, one to the AXU and one to the XU. But they have to be, you know, two separate, they have to, you have to have, uh, you know, at least one AXU instruction and one XU instruction ready to go. So if you only have, X, if you have four threads and they all have, you know, integer add operations, which are XU instructions, they'll all have to queue up and wait to get into the XU pipeline, and the AXU pipeline will be idle. But if you have one thread that has a floating point add, which is an AXU instruction, and one thread that has a you know, integer add, they can both go down separate pipelines, you'll get two instructions per cycle. Um, so that's one of the things you want to look at when you're programming the BlueGene queue, if you're trying to understand the performance. Just think two instructions per cycle is the best you can do, but to get that, you have to have at least two hardware threads. Um, okay, so let's continue on looking at the core. So I, that was a little bit of detail about the core, and as I mentioned, the core doesn't live alone. It, it's connected to an L1 data cache and an L1 instruction cache. They're both 16 kilobytes uh, big. Uh, and then they're fronted by an L1 prefetcher. So this is a little bit of hardware that tries to anticipate what instruction, what data you're gonna need next. So if it sees you moving linearly through an array, um, it will start to understand that, oh, you're going and accessing the first element of the array, then the second, then the third, and after, after it sees a, this pattern emerging, it'll start to go ahead and start grabbing the, you know, the fifth, sixth, seventh data element before your, your instructions, your code actually gets to them and tries to use them. So the idea is that it's moving data into the core before you need it. Um, and using the L1 prefetcher well um, can be advantageous because you'll have your data close to the processor when you need it. Um, it has a special feature called list-based prefetching where you can actually, instead of just having it try to guess what you need, you can tell it explicitly, this is the data access pattern I'm gonna use, so go ahead and start grabbing this data for me. So there's an API to this. If anybody's interested, I can point you to it, but it's one of the features. I would say it's not widely used, but it's potentially beneficial to anybody pro programming on the BlueGene queue. Um, I mentioned before the crossbar switch. So all your cores, your L1s and your L1 prefetchers, all 18 of them sit on one side of the processor core, or the crossbar, and all your L2 slices are on the other side. Now the nice thing is the crossbar is basically an all-to-all -all network that connects you know, everything, all the L2 slices to all the cores with no contention between you know, an individual core and an individual slice. And it really can give you very uh, really high performance. So you can get uh, 400 gigabytes per second of read uh, bandwidth and 200 gigabytes per second of write bandwidth. So if, you, if you're running something that's mostly operating out of your L2 core, uh, L2 cache, um, you can do pretty well. Um, now, you're, there's 16 slices, so the L2 is 32 megabytes total. It's shared by all the cores, so this is not a NUMA architecture. Every core sees the same memory and they have the same connection through the crossbar to the memory. So there's no difference in latency or bandwidth from every, any memory address to any core. Um, it serves as a point of coherency, so this is a cache coherent architecture, so all the cores uh, see a coherent memory uh, space. And, and this is where the coherence is, is uh, maintained. Um, and so basically your, your data is striped across these uh, cores. So if you're going through an array, typically what'll happen is the, the uh, memory addresses are hashed and sort of distributed across the L2 slices so that you get high bandwidth um, going from the L2 to an individual core. Um, it's 16-way uh, set associative, and it's got about 82 uh, cycles of latency to read uh, data out of the L2, and I, I it was on the previous slide, I don't think I mentioned it, but the L1 has six cycles of latency. Um, so you can see as you, as you go away from the processor, the time, the number of clock cycles that it takes to get your data from that cache increases from six to 82. So a significant increase, but it's still better than going to main memory. Um, so your main memory, we have, I mentioned we have two controllers. Um, each of the controllers are connected to um, eight of the 16 slices. Uh, the memory bandwidth is, peak is about 42 gigabytes per second. So you can see this is significantly less than what you get from the L2. So we had 400 gigabytes per second of read bandwidth uh, from the L2, and going to the main memory, we have 
uh, 42 gigabytes per second, and the latency goes up to 350 gigabytes per second. So getting good cache utilization out of this architecture, and pretty much any architecture these days, is important because you lose so much in bandwidth and add so much to latency um, that if you can block your code well and get it to run out of L2 primarily on the, the blue gene because it's 32 gigabytes, whereas the L1 is 16 kilobytes, not very big. So you really want to focus on trying to get as much reuse out of the L2 as you can. Um, and I mentioned the QPX instructions. So these are basically four wide uh, SIMD instructions, so vector instructions, sort of a block diagram. So you have your A2 core on the right. It's issuing um, an instruction. And at the top, you have basically uh, you know, your um, floating point registers. And a normal uh, power PC, you just have the, the one that's colored dark or darker blue um, there on the left. So it's a 64-bit <laughs> register. On the BlueGene Q, these, these are the 64-bit register is replicated four times. So it essentially has an extension of it that makes it a 256-bit register. Um, and so there's essentially four uh, slots in that, that vector register. And each one of those is connected to a pipeline that can do, uh, or functional units that can do floating point operations. So if you issue just a regular PowerPC floating point add, an F add instruction, uh, it'll go through the first, it'll use the first register, uh, first person, portion of the register and go through the first functional unit, uh, the MAD0 unit on the left. But if you use a QPX instruction and you have a four wide add, it'll use the, the four register, uh, components of the register and the four functional units. So you'll get you know, four operations where normally you would just be able to get one. So in the best case scenario, if you're doing floating point add operations, so an F add is you know, a floating point addition with multiplication in it baked together, um, that's two floating point operations for each normal F add, and then you can do four of them um, across the vector uh, SIMD unit, so you can get eight floating point instructions per cycle out of the blue gene queue. Um, it's a six-stage pipeline, so you know, from when your instruction goes in, you're going to have to wait six clock ticks before the results come out, but you can issue a new instruction every cycle, so it'll just fill up the pipeline and, and, and pre proceed through. Uh, I mentioned that there are hardware performance counters on it, and Jackson had talked a bit about this on the Intel chip. So just like the Intel, uh, the BlueGene queues have a rich array of hardware performance counters, and they're basically scattered across all the architectural components. So they have some in the cores, the L1s, the L1Ps, um, each of the L2 slices, in the network units, um, basically everything, in the memory controllers, you know, so throughout the chip. Um, and they all are essentially, then, they're all connected to a central unit called the UPC, which basically goes around and pulls them periodically and pulls the data into this uh, UPC unit that you can query um, from your code. So there's an API called BGPM that you can use to access the hardware counters. Um, if, you've got, if you've ever used PAPI, which is sort of an abstraction of the, the hardware counter specifics, uh, PAPI is available on the BlueGene queue. It sits right on top of BGPM, so you can either, if you want to know how many floating point operations your code did, for instance, you can add, you know, use the PAPI API to query the number of flops seen by the hardware performance counters. or if you want, you can go right to the BGPM API if you haven't used PAPI before. Um, and the counters on this chip are, are very well set up. Um, we've used them quite a bit. You can get all sorts of useful information. You can see how many bytes are going across, the or how many packets are going across the network, how many accesses there are to the main memory, um, how many cache misses you have, how many instructions you've issued, instructions per cycle, all sorts of goodies that you can use to optimize your code. Um, okay, so the blue gene would not be the blue gene without the network side of things. So we all, so far, we basically talked about the processor core. Um, the processor core, like I said, we have a lot of them, but they're kind of, you know, they're not going to do much unless they're connected to each other. And in this case, we've got to click a lot of them together and do it in a way that gives you high bandwidth and low latency. So what IBM chose was a 5D uh, Taurus network. So uh, this is kind of, 5D is really hard to visualize. I, I, don't, I could never find a good diagram for a 5D Taurus. Um, this is kind of an attempt, but not a very good one on the right here. Um, does everybody kind of have a feel for what a 3D Taurus looks like? You know, it's basically a 3D array, right, of processors in space, and everybody can talk to their nearest neighbor. So if you're, you think of your, you're in an apartment building, and you can, you have neighbors above you, below you, to the left, and to the right, and you can, if you want to exchange, you know, talk to anybody in the outside world, you have to, you only have connections to those guys. So you can send a message to your neighbors, up, down, left, right, forward, or back, in a 3D torus. And if you get to the end of the building, it kind of wraps around, the, the connection wraps around to the other side of the building. So that's what these kind of blocks represent, is a 3D torus. And then if you take a 3D torus and another 3D torus and connect all the uh, identical nodes, so each torus has a node 0 and a node 0. If you connect node 0 with another link and node 1 with another link, that gives you a 4D torus. And if you replicate that, that gets you a 5D torus. So what we have is basically 10 nearest neighbors in a 5D torus. So you have up, down, left, right, and then 
four others that have no name in, in 3D space. Um, but the idea is you have, you know, basically 10 neighbors that you can talk to. And if you want to talk to somebody who's not adjacent to you, it has to be passed through one of those neighbors to the other neighbor. Now, the nice thing about a 5D tour is, you know, it's hard to visualize, but it's nice because it makes everybody closer. So if you have the same number of nodes on a 3D tour, you know, people, the longest hop away, your, your furthest distance to your neighbor is further. It might be, let's say, 32 hops. So it would have to pass your message down through 32 neighbors. In this case, on a 5D tour, you can kind of shrink that distance so it doesn't have to go as far. So that, you know, the equivalent distance might end up being, you know, for the equivalent number of nodes, you might end up only having to go through 16 neighbors. So it makes the distance shorter and the networking uh, latency and performance better. Um, okay, so one of the nice features about this on the BlueGene queue is when you run a job on the machine, every job essentially gets their own independent little partition of the machine and their own Taurus network. So when you run a job on this, you get a Taurus network that exists for you and only for you. So no one else's network traffic will ever cross your network space. So you don't have to worry about if, if somebody else is running a job on the system and they're doing you know, an all-to-all -all communication that's really a bandwidth hog, your simulation slows down. That will never happen because you're in your own electrically isolated little partition. So it's like you've got your own little supercomputer, or in the case of using the whole machine, you know, the whole machine to yourself. Um, so on this machine, unlike the previous blue genes, there's no separate collectives or barrier network. So everything's done through this all-to-all -all network, but the collectives are highly optimized. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, we have both electrical and uh, fiber optic connections on the machine. Uh, network performance. So I said we have 10 neighbors, so we have 10 links. Each of those links can broadcast and receive at two gigabytes per second, uh, which means we can do, each link can handle four gigabytes per second, two going in, two coming out. And since we have 10 of them, we can get uh, 40 gigabytes per second total of data moving through that particular node. And from software can actually achieve 90% of that available um, bandwidth. So you can get 1.8 gigabytes per second in each direction per link. Uh, the latency, so if you want to send a message, it has to, you know, to someone who's not your nearest neighbor, it's going to have to traverse several nodes. It's going to have to hop along the network. Um, each of those hops is 40 nanoseconds, so uh, about 20 clock cycles or so, 30 clock cycles. Um, so the round trip to your nearest is about 80 nanoseconds, and to the furthest is 3 microseconds. And then overall network performance that you'll see, you know, sort of from the software level um, to your nearest neighbor, you can get up around, uh, it should be 90% of peak. Uh, bisexual bandwidth for the machine is 93% of peak, uh, all to all, again, 97. So the point here is that you can basically drive this network and get, you know, almost all the hardware performance out of it through using MPI. Basically, this is a little bit of detail that just further, uh, you know, gives you some further insight into how the network hardware works. And basically what it boils down to is each node has 10, uh, 11 receivers and 11 send units. So data that flows into the node that's passing through comes into one of these receivers. If it's going out, to another node, so if it's being passed through to another uh, node down the chain, just comes into one of these receivers, basically goes through an arbitration, uh, a crossbar switch, and straight on out to the next guy. So it never goes through the CPU on the middle hop. And data that's coming in that you're sending out basically goes through one of these uh, injection or receive FIFO. So FIFO is a first in, first out queue. So essentially your node pushes some data into the FIFO, it goes through the crossbar switch and out to the appropriate lane um, uh, onto the tours. And there's actually hardware that can drive, so that was a networking, um, you know, send-receive hardware, and there's actually a, a unit called a messaging unit uh, that's built into the processor uh, that will handle the, the tra moving the data from main memory onto into the, uh, the network FIFOs. So the processor, once it says, oh, I want to send a message to, you know, node number, rank number 23, um, all it has to do is basically say, you know, I want to send this message to rank 23. This is, you know, the message is four megabytes long, and it starts at this pointer address, and it can send just basically that header information to the messaging unit, and then the messaging unit can take over moving the data, packetizing it, and sending it out across the network. So this offloads so a lot of the work of sending messages from the processor cores into other hardware. So your processor can then, as soon as it sets up and sends it, if it does an MPI I send, it can just return. You can continue your computation while all this is happening in the background of the messaging unit. Um, so I.O. real quickly. Um, so essentially I.O., you know, anytime you want to read or write from the disk, this follows a slightly different path than what you see on the, um, on the Taurus. So it's basically going to have to leave the Taurus somewhere and go out and start connecting to a storage system. So basically, when you do a read or write operation from the compute node, it's going to find the nearest I.O. node. I.O. node is a, essentially a compute node that's running a, a full Linux operating system and is connected to the, uh, the storage network. 
And so it's going to basically offload the I.O. operations onto uh, the, your compute node's going to offload the I.O. operations onto the I.O. node, and the I.O. node's going to handle doing the read and writes um, through the parallel file system that's, uh, that's running and then connected to the 30 some odd petabytes of disk, for instance, that we have running at um, Argon. So if, if you have issues with I.O. on the system, you want to start looking in detail at how your data is transversing, uh, you know, getting transferred from the compute nodes through the I.O. nodes, then uh, onto the I.O. subsystem. And finally, I just want to talk a little bit, I got two slides, I think, on the, um, the software for the Blue Gene Queue. So uh, as Pete was saying, you know, so the, the Blue Gene Queue is designed holistically. So it's not just, you know, someone designed a processor and someone else designed a network and a third party wrote the, the, the software, right? It was all designed together to work together. And so a big part of getting good performance out of the system is having a good software stack that sits on top of the hardware. And so just like for the hardware, the emphasis was on scalability. If you have scalable hardware, you have to have scalable software in order to utilize it. Um, so that manifests itself primarily in things like CNK, which are basically a low noise um, compute node operating system, because you have very low jitter across the network. Um, as I said before, you want to have, even though we want to de develop specialized software, we still want, from the programmer perspective, we want it to be familiar. So again, we have things like MPI and OpenMP that are following the same you know, standards that everybody else is using. They're just optimized and designed, specific, implemented specifically for the Blue Gene Queue. Um, so we also, along those lines, they follow standards wherever possible and use open source software wherever possible in their software stack. Um, given that, though, they're still trying to get as much performance out of the system, so they've tailored these open source and standard you know, uh, APIs such as MPI to the hardware um, so you're able to utilize things like the uh, quad FPU, uh, the DMA unit that drives uh, data across the network, the list-based prefetcher, and some of the other things that I mentioned. Um, and in addition to that, they've done some work with optimizing the uh, math library. So um, you know, IBM provides an optimized BLAST library uh, called ESSL. And if you look at the overall programming environment, then it's going to look very familiar to you. You're going to have basically Linux-based um, programming environment with C, C++, Fortran, OpenMP 3.1. Uh, you're going to have debuggers that you see on many other systems like TotalView. Uh, you'll see tools that run in other places, including HPC Toolkit, Cal, Pappy, and Valgrind. Uh, the message passing is standard MPI, so it's based on Argon's MPitch uh, MPI implementation. But underneath that, IBM's written their own software layer called PAMI. Uh, and it's actually a two-level software layer. One is called SPI, which is basically the lowest level driver to the network hardware. And you can actually program to this if you want. Uh, I know a few people have, so the Lattice QCD uh, project, for instance, has, is they've written, you know, they skipped MPI and they've gone all the way down to SPI. Uh, and, and that'll give them lower latency in terms of, you know, cutting out some of the intervening software between the MPI layer and the SPI layer. If you don't want to go quite that low, there's a, a middle layer called PAMI. Um, and on top of PAMI is where MPI is implemented. Uh, and these are designed specifically to drive the hardware, uh, the networking hardware efficiently and give you the maximum bandwidth and minimum latency. As I mentioned, CNK, the compute node operating system, is on the OS, uh, compute nodes. Uh, and it pretty much gives you most of what you would get on a normal Linux uh, operating system with a few uh, exceptions. So like you can't create new processes and things like that. Um, and finally, you know, you have multiple ways of running jobs on the system. You can do sort of single MPI jobs across the whole Taurus. You can do multiple sub-jobs, multiple programs that share the same MPI com world, or a bunch of parallel uh, programs that are spawned independently. Uh, and with that, I think I'll conclude because I'm running out of time and I'll take any questions. Comment on the next generation blue team machines after building key? Yeah, that's an easy answer. There is none. And IBM is going in a somewhat different direction. Um, so they're not going to, you won't see something from IBM uh, that looks like a blue jean, you know, R or whatever, uh, which is unfortunate because I think, you know, blue jean's been a very successful product and probably one of the best platforms that I've ever worked on, the Q in particular. So it's. What's that the other direction? What's that? What's the other direction? Well, well that, yeah, fortunately that we can't comment on right now. So that's, you'll have to wait until IBM announces it. Um, so this QPX, I didn't really recall, is it single precision or double precision? Uh, you can do both, but double precision is typically what? Uh, so you can still do, uh, so all floating point operations on the um, PowerPC chips are done as double precision in the register. So if you load a single precision number into a register and then you do an add, it still does a double precision add, but when you store it, it just chops off, it, it converts it to single precision. So yeah, so you don't lose anything by doing double precision. You can still do eight double precision operations per cycle. You lose cache. 
What's that? You lose access to cache if you. Yeah, if, if you, yeah, you, you'll, you'll stress the memory bandwidth more if you do double precision, certainly from a memory perspective, yes, from a you know, processor throughput, if everything's in, you know, in registers already, you're, you're fine. Yeah. One trade off in uh, deciding about the dimension of the tors. Uh, so initially it was 3D, then they moved to 5D, but why not 7D or something? <laughs> Honestly, I don't know um, ultimately how they settled on 5. I mean, I, the, the main argument was that as you add more nodes, it stresses a 3D torus because things get further and further away. So I think what they did is they had to sort of, um, you know, increase the torus dimensionality until they got things, you know, so that the, the furthest away node was not more than they wanted, you know, wanted to see in terms of latency. I don't know why they didn't go to seven. You know, I don't know. Neighbors, right? Yeah. yeah. So I mean, the number of the number of wires and routers per node also goes up, right? Because if, if we take your your argument, then you say, well, why not have an yeah all the way? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, that's, why I was, yeah. that's why I was asking about the, the trade-offs. Yeah. Um, so it seems like the physical limitation uh, and, the, and the space and power. You have to put more you know, routers for each one yeah. of those wires on a node. Yeah. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's cost, right? You know, so I guess, yeah, what Pete is saying, you, know, you have more links, you have more routers that cost more money. And so you know, when you go from five to seven, is the, you know, the marginal improvement on performance you know, outweigh the marginal cost increase? in doing that, and apparently the answer was no. So. Uh, and on paper, this L1 prefetcher with the lid seems to be really, really good for stencil computations. Uh, have you seen any real applications that have? Um, you know, I, that, that was the thinking that went into it. I, in practice, I have not seen too many people try to utilize it. I, it may just be that, you know, the API is unique to the BlueGene queue, so people don't want to put non-portable. It, it can improve performance. I've definitely seen that, you know, instances of that. Um, but uh, you know, it's I think a lot dependent on what your code looks like, and the the, the improvement you get. I, I, I'd have I, I couldn't say off the top of my head what, what people are typically seeing. I don't recall it being something where I was like you know so impressed that I was like oh, everybody should be doing this. But certainly it's beneficial. It, it, um, it's just a question of whether the programming complexity you know outweighs the benefit. You know, if you're getting five percent speed up, do you really want to do it? Um, you know, so, but it's. It, I think for any code, if you're, you know, I'd encourage you to try looking at it. You know, it's not hard to, to use. The API is relatively simple, though, um, so it's it's worth experimenting with. I would say. But is it true that this machine was specifically made for lattice QCD for quantum growth dynamics? Uh, this machine, no. I mean, the original Blue Jeans came out of some of the work that was done in QCD. Um, so Algera uh, came out of Columbia, went to IBM, and he was the lattice QCD guy. So the, the QCD OC architecture was initially designed for lattice QCD. Um, the blue gene itself, though, I mean, it is really, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not, you know, application specific. I, it's multi-purpose as much as any other architecture is out there. Um, in fact, I would say it's better than a lot of them. It's, it's more general purpose because it's not more nicely balanced between network uh, memory and processor speed. So it tends to bottleneck less on certain, you know, memory access patterns or network operations than you might see on you know, an InfiniBand cluster, let's say. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, regarding the network, yeah, you said that the collective is optimized. So the optimization is done in the MPI implementation level. <coughs> Well, so there, there's there's hardware on the chip, and actually, I kind of skimmed through that part because uh, it was a, at the end of the presentation. I was right, but there's actually so you know things like all reduce and stuff can be done in hardware on the network, so that the optimizations you know are multi-tiered, so that you could do optimizations and algorithms algorithms at the high level in MPI, and then there's further uh, you know architecture specific aspects in PAMI and the SPI layer that would utilize you know the the hardware that exists on the network to accelerate things like barriers, broadcasts. And reductions. Because when I used the Lugin L, there was a three level, uh, three like uh, network. Yeah, yeah. So, so the Blue Gene L and P had you know three networks. You know, so you had the, the the barrier, the collectives, and the point to point. And so what they did is sort of you know yeah they, they got rid of the other two networks. So everything's running over the point to point network. But they've designed the network in a way with the networking hardware that really I I haven't. You know, I would say that the performance of those aspects, the barriers and the collectives, are just as good on Blue Gene Q as they were on PRL. Anything else? 
How does the blue jeans perform in terms of input and output? Uh, you mean file system or? Uh, so that's specific. So, so the file system is a separate subsystem that, you know, if you went to one location, they may be running Luster or something like that. Another location may be running, you know, like we are GPFS. Um, I believe, I, I would say like, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think our GPFS network can get 240 gigabytes per second um, read off the network, uh, you know, so Basically, it should let you checkpoint the, that should be sufficient to let you checkpoint the entire contents of memory in less than about 15 minutes. Um, so, you know, in most cases, people don't have to check, you know, checkpoint the entire network contents to do a restart or something like that. So for, you know, for well laid out IO, and that's a big caveat here, because if you try, if you have the wrong IO strategy, you're gonna kill any parallel file system. Like for instance, if you have, you know, 500,000 ranks all trying to read from the same file, um, without blocking that across, you know, portions of the file and doing good MPI um, I/O type calls, you're, you're going to see very poor I/O. But for well laid out I/O, you can get yeah upwards of you know 150 gigabytes per second through our um, parallel file system that mirrors on. I tried it with uh, Blue Gene B to write in multiple files. Mm -hmm. and each processor is writing in a different file. It didn't work that. Were all the files in the same directory, or are they? Uh, yeah. Okay, so that so one of the things is many of the parallel file systems, the metadata operation, so like opening the file is serialized. So if, if everybody's trying to open the same file or different files, they'll be serialized and the file opens will really slow you down. Um, and also it depends on how the files are striped across it. I'm not, I'll say I'm not an IO expert. I recently was working with some guys to, to improve their... Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> next Tuesday, a week from tomorrow, there's a full day on uh, IO and data things. So, so what, I, what I do know is you can do well. I've seen instances of people doing exceptionally well on, on Mira. And so in most cases, it's because you have some sort of suboptimal layout. And usually the changes are not really painful to fix it. it it's usually some minor surgery and nothing to, you know. So there's a, like writing each file in a different directory or something That can help uh, if you have many files and using MPIIO, it can also help a lot. So it can basically, uh, those MPIIO collective operations can do a lot for organizing your I.O.